so the question we're, we're interested in in this paper is, can frothy conditions in asset markets somehow define uh, matter not only from the perspective of an investor in these markets, but matter from the macro economy? Okay, so what I have in mind, uh, I, mean, I thought about this quite a bit when I was at the Fed, if you're Janet Yellen, essentially, and I tell you something like, wow, the price earnings, Schiller's price earnings ratio on the stock market is abnormally high. Expected returns on stocks are probably low. Or credit spreads are at the 10th percentile of their historical distribution, probably not good for returns to credit market investors. Is any of that stuff relevant for the macro economy? Does any of that portend anything sort of uh, uh, you know, bad or, 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 or risky? Okay? And the question that we're interested in speaking to, so this is the hypothesis. I'm not going to claim that we have kind of definitive evidence on the hypothesis, but the hypothesis that motivates our work is the idea that if credit markets in particular become overheated, and it's a sort of value judgment laden work, but if credit markets become overheated in the sense that expected returns are low, um, that that can lead to reversals, and associated with those reversals can be something that is damaging to credit supply and ultimately to the macro economy. So I think it, by, by articulating the hypothesis this way, we're trying to capture what I think is sort of the conventional wisdom that you know if you let credit bubbles get too hot, they're going to do some damage. Okay, and they're going to do some damage by somehow hurting the process of credit supply. So I'll try to give you a little bit of evidence uh, uh, on this. Again, I don't think it's decisive. Now, just to be clear, in the back of our minds is another question, which is, should monetary policy ever concern itself with these sorts of things? In other words, <laughs> might you ever, you know, if I tell you we're near full employment, inflation is pretty quiescent, just looking at those two variables, you'd be inclined to go very slow in normalizing monetary policy. If I add another piece of information, and that piece of information is, wow, credit markets are really, again, credit spreads are at the fifth percentile of their historical distribution, does that make you do something different? Would you want to tighten a little bit to sort of let the air out of the bubble? Okay? We're going to have very little to say about that question, but ultimately that's kind of the thing that we're after. You know, I think the evidence in this paper keeps open the door to the answer to that latter question being yes. It leaves open the possibility that you, know, you might want to do something, but our evidence is not going to be enough to get you all the way from here to there. Okay? But I mean, obviously, that's, that's why sort of spending some time with the Fed, we, we sort of started with these, these questions. And I think of the evidence here, again, it's sort of necessary, but not sufficient to, to answer that, that sort of stuff. All right? So first of all, you know, I've been kind of loose. I'm talking about kind of froth and sentiment. To be more precise, I mean, this, this will go easily with you guys. When I say sentiment is elevated, that is nothing more than a sort of, again, judgment-laden way of saying expected returns objectively from sort of an expected, you know, return forecasting model are low. Okay, so the one thing, the one thing that I think everybody in finance has taken on board, people in macro much less so, is the idea that, you know, what, what, what is the intersection of what Fama and Schiller believe is that there's a lot of forecastable time variation in expected returns. Okay, so high sentiment here is low expected returns. Um, in, the, in the case of credit markets, two variables uh, that, that, and this is due to my colleagues uh, Sam Hansen and Robin Greenwood, two variables that do a pretty good job of forecasting the returns to credit. So this is, what are the returns to you as an investor, you know, junk bonds relative to treasuries, okay? Two, two variables that do a good job of forecasting those returns over, say, a two-year horizon are credit spreads and high yield issues. Okay, credit spreads very intuitive. When credit spreads are lower, all else equal, that's not only about expected defaults being lower, some of that's about compensation for risk. So when credit spreads are lower, the market is overheated in the sense that it's more heated in the sense that returns going forward will be lower. Another variable which they found tracks uh, returns quite well is the high yield issuance share. This is essentially the fraction of high yield bond issues divided by total bond issues. That's maybe intuitively just a little bit less obvious, but one way to think about this is in a reach for yield world, if investors are reaching for yield, what would smart issuers do? Well, the investors really want yield. You know, maybe because of some agency problem, they want to show their end investors that they're earning a high yield. Maybe the right thing to do is not to take all of that up in a lower yield to them, a lower credit spread, but to get them on some of the non-price terms. So you might think that some of that risk appetite is taken up by weaker covenants, 
lower you know, status in the, in the priority structure and all of that. If that's the case, credit spreads won't necessarily be a sufficient statistic, but issuance decisions will tell you something. Because when you see the issuers issuing a lot, particularly those that issue kind of lower down in the credit spectrum, they're telling you something about credit being cheap. Okay? So those two variables basically, and this is their work, not ours, those two variables seem to be moderately informative about the returns to credit. Okay? What we find in our paper basically is that if credit market sentiment is elevated in year T minus two, so this is going to be using a long sample from 1929 to the present in the US. The credit market sentiment is elevated in the sense of the fitted value, the forecasted value of bond returns being low. Okay? Two things will happen. The first thing is they will then widen. There's mean reversion. That's not our finding. That's just a restatement of theirs. Okay? But and what's novel to our thing is that widening of credit spreads is associated in time with a fairly significant decline in economic activity in year T, T plus 1, and T plus 2. So very, you know, specifically, if I tell you this year that credit spreads are very narrow and high yield issuance is booming, you should be, all else equal, a bit more pessimistic about how you will do as an investor in credit, but also somewhat more pessimistic, all else equal, about how the macro economy will Okay? So that's the sense in which there's some information content for, for the real economy. Now, let me try to give you a sense of the magnitude here. Magnitude is actually surprisingly strong. So, if credit market sentiment, so again, standing here, T minus two, okay? If you're standing in year minus, T minus two, and I tell you credit market sentiment has moved from the 25th to the 75th percentile of its historical distribution, meaning forecasted returns two years ahead have moved by about 30 basis points. That's what this, what, what this translates to. Um, the, uh, the associated uh, uh, decline in GDP growth cumulatively over the years four percentage points. That's a big, that's a sort of big impact on GDP, or said in terms of the unemployment rate, this forecasts cumulative um, increase in the unemployment rate of about two percentage points. So again, that's a fairly big, uh, a fairly big effect. In fact, it's so big, I think that if I was trying to tell you this kind of causal story, where it's happening, not because it's sort of a passive predictor, but it's actually telling you something about a future credit supply effect, I think you ought to sort of instinctively think that even, you know, even if you're kind of a little primed to believe this, that it feels sort of big, okay? Um, and one, one way you might, you might put this is in terms of kind of an identification problem. You know, maybe you're sort of willing to believe my regressions at some level, but you're sort of pretty skeptical about the story. Now, one skepticism would be, well, maybe if I tell you that the bond market is really euphoric this year, okay? Maybe that has an effect that doesn't run through. So in other words, I'm going to do things that look like instrumental variables regressions. They're going to be two-step regressions. First, I'm going to use some lag stuff to forecast bond returns. Then I'm going to take the expected return from that and stick it in another equation, and I'm going to use that to forecast GDP. You can implement our paper by pushing a button on the thing that's in state that says instrumental variables. Okay? But it's not sort of kosher as an instrumental variable because of what you might call a violation of the exclusion restriction. That is to say, this sort of initial euphoria could be affecting the real economy in other ways as opposed to just the sort of the, 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 the credit supply chain. So for example, if I said well, credit markets are really euphoric this year, maybe guys are raising a lot of money and doing dumb stuff with the money, okay? And then that dumb stuff will come home to roost but it may come home to roost whether or not there's a subsequent inward shift in credit supply. Take a concrete example. You know, rates were, you know, credit was really cheap in the middle part of the 2000s. People built a lot of houses. Okay? It may be that having built all those houses, there had to be, there was an oversupply of housing, there had to be a shakeout in the housing sector, whether or not mortgages subsequently became more expensive. Okay. Our story is really much more narrow. It's the idea that because rates were low, there was going to be a reckoning and mortgages were going to have to get more expensive. Okay? So I think it's got to be that at least, I think it's a plausible thought, that at least a lot of the, or some of this effect is not coming through the narrow channel we have in mind, but just this broader kind of real side effect. Now, we try to make in the paper a little bit of, of progress on this. And the basic idea is if the story that I, I have in mind is right, 
I ought to be able to forecast with my same sort of sentiment indicators, not only the real side, but something about the financing mix. So this is essentially a story about, you know, a question of the supply versus the demand for credit. So the story I want to tell is things are euphoric today, there's mean reversion, credit is going to get expensive in the future. Okay? Alternative story, things are euphoric today, guys build too much so investment demand is lower in the future. If it's the first story, you want to see, and it's all about how debt is going to get expensive in the future, in addition to the real side effects, you should also see people, uh, firms making capital structure adjustments. Okay? So if I have this idea that you know, the markets are somewhat segmented, you can have independent movements in the cost of debt and equity, I should be forecasting essentially two years ahead that debt is going to get expensive, and firms, in addition to investing less, will borrow less, for example, and issue more equity or borrow less to do share repurchases. So I'm going to try and use my same approach that we use to forecast real activity to forecast essentially changes in the financing mix. Okay, And it's going to turn out pretty clearly that you, you get some of this. So the same overheated credit market at time T forecasts less in the way of debt finance share repurchases two, three years down the road. Okay? So that's, that's one thing that helps, I think, a little bit. It doesn't, to be clear, it doesn't make the case um, that this whole quantitative magnitude is due to, due to this channel. At some level, if you want to walk away from this talk thinking 20% of this quantitative magnitude is due to the channel we have in mind, and the other 80% is due to the overbuilding of houses effect, there's no evidence that I haven't really pushed as hard against them. Okay, at best, I'm trying to sort of show you the aggregate evidence and show you that there is something that looks like it's the, the, the traces of, of this credit supply. Okay, um, so that's one piece of it. The other, um, the other piece is there's a cross-sectional thing, which is if you think that what's happening is there's time variation in the relative pricing of credit, that credit risk premium, there's a sort of aggregate fact that credit risk premium are sometimes high and sometimes low, that ought to matter not so much for investment grade firms. So think about investment grade firms. How much can their debt ever be overpriced or underpriced given that their credit spreads are very small, versus via a leverage effect, it ought to matter more for essentially junk bond rate firms. So another prediction of this thing that you wouldn't just get out of a simple version of the overbuilding hypothesis is that the aggregate investment effects that we document ought to be stronger as you go to lower credit quality categories. Okay? So the combination of looking at capital structure, basically, and looking in the cross-section at um, in terms of different credit qualities, is an effort to try to at least push back a little bit on this alternative story. So I'll show you some, some evidence to that effect. Again, I don't think it's completely, uh, completely decisive. Okay. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff in macro that looks at, uh, at, at financial markets and business cycle fluctuations. Bernanke and Gertler um, is one of the early papers. I think what we're trying to do that's a little bit different. I mean, one way to say, I think we're trying to put some of the ideas of behavioral finance, or just of essentially finance in the sense of the importance of time variation and risk premium into sort of thinking about that. So one way to say this is most of the models that follow Bernanke and Gertler, you can think about those in a risk neutral setting. These are models in which essentially the profitability of financial intermediation, or the efficiency of financial intermediation is varying over time. It's kind of like the cash flows are varying over time. But you can think about the discount rate as just being constant. Whereas our whole thing is it's all about time varying discounts. And it also has a bit of a feeling of, you know, bad times follow good. Okay? In this sense, I think we're trying to be a little bit in the spirit of the sort of more informal uh, uh, discussions by Minsky and Kimberberg and others. Um, I should say there's also been a bunch of other recent papers. Um, uh, Shalara and Taylor, um, Jordan Shalara and Taylor, Sean, Christian Murphy, and Moore, which are also kind of in the spirit. And by the way, Shalarik and Taylor, I mean, if we, if they hadn't used the title that they, you know, they have titles for their papers like When Credit Bites Back, or The Dark Side of Credit Booms, like we're very much in the same spirit. Okay? That there's some mean reversion mechanism and there's some price to be paid for periods of these. Okay, so that's, that's what we're trying to be about. Um, by the way, when I say credit spreads, obviously there's lots of variables you could use for a credit spread. In order to have a single time series that's reasonably consistent over a long period of time, 
we were using here the BAA Treasury corporate bonds. That's a sort of standard thing. Another thing people sometimes use is BAA minus AAA. Over a very long period of time, what an AAA firm is has changed quite a bit. So we opted to use Treasuries as the benchmark. Nothing much, nothing much particularly hangs on. Uh, okay. Let me start by showing you. So this is not our main thing. Let me start by showing you some totally atheoretic regressions. This is just a kind of a benchmark. And this stuff goes back to um, goes back to Fama, goes back to, in fact, I learned one of these regressions when I saw it sat in Bob Merton's course in 1984. So one of these is a paper by uh, uh, Merton and Fisher. So let's see what we can do. A little hard to do right now. Okay. Um, so what am I running here? This, as I said, this is the simplest thing you could think to do. This is the change in GDP in year T plus one against a time T change in an asset market price. So I'm going to document the astonishing fact here that asset prices are forward looking. Okay? So what does this first regression say? This is the change in credit spread in year T, forecasting the change in GDP in year T plus one. Totally unsurprisingly, if I tell you credit spreads widen this year, GDP is going to go down. Okay? That's 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 all that's right. Similar thing here, this is the return on the aggregate stock market. If I tell you the stock market went up, this is literally Fisher and Burton. I tell you the stock market went up in year T, GDP will go up in year T plus one. Okay? This says really nothing at all about channels. Why your, your, your most natural thing to, to think is, well, suppose the economy is moving around for completely exogenous reasons, asset prices are forward looking, they're going to give you a little bit of a heads up you know, ahead of time. Okay? And an interesting thing to just point out about these regressions, if you look at um, essentially the standardized effects, so that 0.37 is saying, a one standard deviation change in the credit spread is associated with the 0.37 standard deviation impact on GDP. You see that basically the explanatory power, if you will, of credit spreads and the stock market are about the same. Or if you like, you can put the two in the regression together and they share the credit fairly equally. So asset prices are forward. Okay? Now, okay. your most natural reaction to that is because the stock market today or the bond market today anticipates future cash flows. Okay. So now we're going to do something a little different. Okay, as I said, you can think about this as an instrumental variables thing. It's not, it's not at all kosher IV, but one thing I think it does do is it cuts against the simplest forward-looking cash flows. Right, so this thing has two pieces. It's a little more complicated. In the bottom panel, as I said, it's a two-step procedure. In the bottom panel, we measure investor sentiment by trying to forecast either stock returns or future changes in credit spreads. Okay? So the first column in the bottom panel here is essentially the Greenwood Hansen regression. This says that when the high yield share is high in year T minus two, when there's a lot of junk bond issuance in, T minus, in year T minus two, credit spreads will subsequently widen. Okay? Or when the level of credit spreads is high, they will subsequently narrow. This is literally is a mean reversion. The level forecasts the change with a negative sign. That's just mean reversion. Okay. So these two together, these two together, I can use to create a fitted value, a forecasted value of the change in credit spreads, and that's my notion of sentiment. Okay. It's just a forecasted expected return. And you can see this first stage regression, you know, we're forecasting an asset uh, thing. It's got an R squared about 10%. So this is exactly their result that turns out if you try to replicate it, it's extremely robust. You get about a 10% R squared forecasting two years ahead the returns on credit. Now we're going to take that and run a regression much like the one I showed you a minute ago. Now we're trying to forecast GDP changes with changes in credit spread, but instead of using the credit spread observed in year T, we're looking at the change in the credit spread that you could forecast two years ago. Okay? So we basically take in this guy from here, the forecast guy from here, we plug it in up here. And again, we get a negative coefficient. So when the credit spread is forecasted to widen, okay, that's T minus two, the sentiment is high, that is bad news for future GDP. Okay, now one thing I want to kind of emphasize here. You might say, okay, big deal. You took the same regression you had before and you just lagged everything by two 
No, but when I lagged it by two years, the sign flipped. Okay? So in the simple one-year, simple look-ahead thing, remember, it was the case that a widening of credit spreads was, I'm sorry, let me say narrow credit spreads were good news in the simple look-ahead. Narrow credit spreads, optimistic, economy's going to do well. Now, two years, because there's a negative here, okay, it's flipping the sign. If I stand two years earlier, narrow credit spreads are actually bad news. Why? Because they will revert, and that reversion will cause some pain in, in, in the real economy. So there's something going on here, and there's something at least a little bit more than the simple lagging by two years. Okay? I think what we've ruled in, other words, I don't think that this speaks to all the mechanisms. This is not consistent. In other words, the ultimate sign here, if you sort of trace through the reduced form, the ultimate sign here is not consistent with the idea that it's just the bond market forecasting future cash flows. It seems to be coming through rather than a cash flow, it seems to be coming through a discount rate mechanism. That you can forecast the future returns, not the cash flows, and it's those future returns which in some way are telling you something. Okay? The other very important thing to note here is, again, in the simple one period ahead, look ahead uh, exercise, the stock market and the bond market are telling you pretty much the same thing. They're both forward looking. Okay? Now, the stock market essentially does nothing. Okay? And it's not because the first stage regression fails. I can forecast stock returns two years ahead and one year ahead about as well as I can forecast bond returns. They just don't matter for the real economy. Okay, so if I tell you stock market sentiment is elevated, the Schiller P-E ratio is high, you should indeed worry as a stock market investor, I suppose, but you shouldn't care as much if you're thinking about the real economy. Okay, why might that be? Again, even though they're really the same in a kind of one period look ahead sense. Why might that be? The interpretation I want to have is, well, there's something causal about credit supply. And as the stock market may be pretty important from a look ahead perspective, but it doesn't have a causal impact on the real economy in the same way, because not that many firms really need to finance themselves in the stock market. On the other hand, if you know, credit provision dries up, that's a bigger deal from the macroeconomic perspective. That's what sort of at least wants to be, you know, what I would like to read from. Um, here is just a graphical view of the same thing. This is just plotting. Um, this is just to give you a sense. Um, to give you a sense of sort of where, where, where the effect comes from. This is just plotting a fitted value on the horizontal axis and the realization of GDP on the, on the vertical axis so you can kind of see that it's not driven by, uh, by just one or two by one or two. Um, I mean, an obvious question, an obvious question is, is this just about, you know, some crazy stuff that happened either in the Great Depression or something that happened in the most recent recession? And the answer seems to be, as best as we can tell, not really. Now, it is the case, it is, it is the case that the Great Depression, the data points that correspond to the Great Depression, tend to increase the magnitude of our estimate. So if you take them out, the estimate goes down a little bit, but a little bit, and it's not particularly sensitive to keeping it. So there's a couple ways to do this. This is um, a version that leaves out all the exciting years. So we don't start, start until the post-war period, and we end it by 2007. So it's got neither the Depression nor the Great Recession. And you can see that basically, that we had that was a minus 5 before, it becomes a minus 3, and it's still economically quite, quite significant. So cutting out all those big years, it does tend to attenuate the number a bit, but there's still, there's still something uh, you know, fairly substantial economic. Uh, fairly substantial. Another way of showing the same thing graphically is to basically plot the estimates that you would get if you estimated our whole thing on a rolling 40-year subset. That is to say, the data point labeled 1970 is a sample that runs from 1930 to 1970. And the data point labeled 2010 is a data point that goes from 1970 to 2010. And you can basically see that this dashed line is a full sample estimate. The years corresponding to the Depression do push this estimate larger, more negative, than say larger in absolute magnitude. But once you get clear of that period, it's been a very stable and robust effect over roughly the last uh, 40 or so years. 
Okay. So there seems to be something, in other words, I don't think what we're picking up is just the one or two most extreme uh, 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 contractions in the, in the sample. It seems to be that this is driven, you can see this also in the scatter plot, a little bit more by kind of, you know, every, or once every seven to ten year kind of business cycle as opposed to the, the once in a lifetime. Uh, the once in a lifetime. So that's, that's the basic effect. This is just showing it now. This is what we had before. This is now saying it lasts for a couple of years. So instead of forecasting just GDP and GDP, it's T plus one and T plus two, and not just forecasting GDP, but business fixed investment and the unemployment rate. You see basically there's a, approximately a three year period over which this, this effect happens. Okay, and when you accumulate these effects, and then you think about a shock that is a 25th to 75th percentile shock, that's where you get the sort of numbers I quoted you before. Okay? So again, if you go from the 25th to the 75th percentile sediment, you trace out something like a 4 percentage point impact on GDP and something like a 2% uh, impact on GDP. Um, as I said, there are lots of other channels. Some of them I can enumerate, some of them are harder to enumerate. One that is easy enough to enumerate is corporate leverage. You might say, well, this is not really about credit supply. It's just that, look, when debt is cheap, firms are going to borrow. Firms borrow too much, well, then they're going to be over levered, and it's going to be the, the condition of them being over levered is going to make them vulnerable, and it's going to make recessions worse, even again if there's no subsequent impact on credit supply. So maybe what we've got is really a proxy for increases in firm leverage. Okay. So this one is at least tractable. I mean, because you can enumerate it and kind of go out and look at it. So here, thanks to, to John and, and his co-authors, who were kind enough to give us this, this terrific series that they constructed. It's basically a, a, a measure of um, uh, leverage for, for the non-financial corporate sector that goes all the way back. We could basically look at this. Okay, so in our basic regressions, you can effectively control for corporate leverage, and it really doesn't, it doesn't make much of a difference. In fact, our variable stays the same. Corporate leverage doesn't really do anything in terms of forecasting uh, the macro economy. Not surprisingly, by the way, if you eyeball their series, it's got very interesting low frequency variation in it, but it just doesn't have much business cycle variation. Okay, so you're, you know, it's just, you know, Think about it for a little bit. Corporate leverage is sort of an integrated series. It's pretty smooth. It's just not, even when these credit spreads kind of go up and down, there's a lot of financing activity, but often a lot of it is refinancing activity. So you just don't get big movements in, in leverage. Now, you might say, that's not really giving the leverage story its, its fair due. You know, looking at aggregate corporate leverage, sure, most guys are not levering up like crazy. Let's look at the more vulnerable firms. Now that we couldn't do as easily with this aggregate series, we had to kind of restrict ourselves to the CompuStat era, and then what we did was we tried to look at the leverage of more highly levered firms. Okay, so we looked at the leverage at the 75th or the 90th percentile of the leverage distribution. Now there you see more at business cycle. You know, the leverage of the 90th percentile levered firm, that tends to go up during these, during these periods. Okay, you know, you, we know that there's sort of LBO activity during these these periods, and the 90th percentile firms show a little bit of that. But still, in terms of you know, forecasting the macro economy, that variable essentially does nothing, and it has little impact on our economy. Again, there are other versions of this sort of you know, other factor story that could certainly be true. It just turns out it's not, it's not in corporate leverage as, as traditionally uh, as traditionally measured. Another interesting thing to look at is bank credit. The reason it's interesting is there's been this very good and, and very influential work now by, by Shalarik and Taylor and Jordan Shalarik and Taylor, again, about sort of the dark side of credit booms. Um, unlike us, they have a much broader sample, so they're looking across countries and over long historical periods. And one thing they find is that booms in sort of bank balance sheets tend to end back. So if you look at five, the last five years of bank balance sheet growth, either loans and securities or just bank loans, when that number has been very high, you subsequently tend to get prices. Okay. So we, we try looking at that in our data. Um, and it replicates in our data in the sense that if you just, you know, it's sort of the same format that we have. If you use the five years lagged, either bank loans plus securities or just bank loan growth, that forecasts output with an 
negative sign. Now, if you just, again, atheoretically run a horse race, um, our, oops, I'm sorry, if you run a horse race between our variable and their variable, in our particular sample, our variable sort of takes most of the explanatory. Our, our variable tends to be just about the same as it was, and their bank credit growth um, tends to be trivial. Um, now, I want to be careful in interpreting this. I don't think that we have, now we're looking at the bond market, and they're looking at banks. That's different data. I don't think we have in mind a deeply different economic story. It's hard for me to imagine a world <coughs> in which credit spreads are really narrow, and bank loan supply is not sort of tracking that in some way. Right? It's almost an arbitrary. So it's not that I think that we have something deeply different. So we're about credit booms, they're about credit booms. I think it may be the case that by using this sort of expected return metric in a country where we sort of have pretty good data, you know, we were able to sort of pick this up in a way that maybe the quantities don't do quite as good a job. Right? So other, you can imagine there's good credit booms and bad credit booms. Sometimes credit growth is growing because the underlying economy is strong. Sometimes it's growing because credit is too cheap. Our thing attempts to separate those two. Theirs doesn't. Maybe we pick up on a little bit more information. But fundamentally, I wouldn't try to put much distance between what we've done. I think of ours as sort of a different implementation of this idea, but pretty much on the same thing. I mean, the one thing I would say from a policy perspective is if you read their stuff and you read it literally, you might say, yeah, these problems are all about the banks going crazy and banks doing too much. And well, geez, then right, maybe the right policy response is more capital in banks. Right? And if we have enough capital in banks, we'll sort of insulate the problem, and that would be the right policy response. Our thing at least opens up the possibility, just by having more of a kind of capital markets focus, that maybe it's not all coming from the banks. And if basically there's just, it's just a feature of markets more generally, that when you know, things get euphoric, they tend to revert, and that reversion can not only damage the extension of bank credit, but also a bond market credit, then at a minimum you might need a different policy tool. Whether that's monetary policy, whether it's something to do with bond funds or whatever, but you might not want to take so much comfort in the idea that you can deal with it entirely through the system. Other than that, when they, when they have these titles like credit bites back, that's certainly very much in the, in the spirit of there. Um, this is an unfortunate slide for, for a this day, but um, all it's trying to do, all it's trying to do is to say, so far, everything I've shown you, you could interpret as consistent, not with anything having to do with credit supply, but again, just with some notion of an overbuilding story, which leads to a subsequent contraction in just investment demand. Okay? So it could be supply, could be demand. All this slide is saying is, imagine you have a firm that basically wants to maximize the NPV of investment, that's the theta as of I, and is also dealing with a market where there's movement in the relative cheapness or richness of debt versus equity. Okay? So delta, when delta is higher, debt is more expensive relative to equity. So that's a violation of MM, which is associated with this credit market center. Okay? So the firm has three objectives here. It wants to maximize the NPV of investment. It wants to not borrow too much if borrowing is expensive. But it doesn't want to distort its capital structure too much either. It doesn't want its actual capital structure to deviate too much from D star, which is its optimal capital structure. Okay? So you throw in a, a, a model with those three considerations, and what does it spit back at you? Something very intuitive, which is if investment demand goes down, investment goes down, if theta, that is to say the appeal of investing goes down, investment goes down, but capital structure doesn't move. If debt gets more expensive, there's going to be some take up on both margins. On the one hand, if you can't adjust your capital structure very flexibly, some of that's going to hit your investment. On the other hand, to the extent that you can move your capital structure around, some of that will be affected in you're taking it up on the capital structure margins. So if it gets more expensive, you'll borrow less and you'll do less share purchases. Or you'll issue, you'll issue that. Okay? So that, first of all, gives you, you know, that allows you to separate. So if I see simultaneously investment going down and debt usage going down relative to equity usage, that seems like it's more of a delta shock, which is the kind of thing I'm looking for, as opposed to a theta shock. Okay? 
And if you're a little more subtle, you can also think about the interaction of those with capital structure flexibility. In other words, firms that can adjust their capital structure, think of those as big firms, might take less of a hit on the investment side and might do a, a bunch of kind of changing of their repurchase uh, stuff. And firms that can't adjust the capital structure as easily will take the hit more on the investment side. Okay? The other thing I think that we naturally think here of Delta as moving more for highly levered firms. In other words, you're, as the aggregate sentiment factor moves, the extent to which this has an effect on your own delta i is greater if you're a, a, a leverage. Okay? Um, so I'll just show you two quick facts uh, associated with this. One is that our same variable, so now what we're doing is we're using sentiment in here t minus 2 to forecast not a real thing, but to forecast share repurchases and debt issues. Okay, this is aggregate flow of funds data. And basically what you see is when sentiment is high today, that is we expect a sort of widening of credit spreads in year T, repurchases are going to fall sharply in year T. This is net equity repurchases, so repurchases go down, or if you want, equity issuance goes up. And debt issuance, same thing. Okay? And these, by the way, are in the same units. So this is dollar for dollar. It's as if firms, I'm forecasting two years ahead, that not only will firms issue and a certain number of dollars less of debt, but that exact amount is the amount by which share repurchases will go down. So there seems to be the ability, again, two years ahead of time, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing, that you can forecast not only kind of a collapse in the real economy, but a fairly dramatic shift in financing patterns. So I think that helps, that helps a little bit. Again, it doesn't, it doesn't follow from this that my whole four percentage points on GDP is coming from a credit supply thing, but I think this at least leaves that door Skip a little bit. The other thing we've done here is we've disaggregated the investment results. Again, I can forecast two years ahead when credit sentiment is high, I can forecast that investment is going to go down. Now I'm asking how is it going to behave across credit quality buckets. Okay? And the answer is, um, loosely speaking, very little effect. Once you control extensively for a bunch of other stuff, like sales, own stock price, industry, industrial production. Once you control for a bunch of stuff at the firm level, just knowing two years ago that credit doesn't tell you really anything for high investment grade firms. It tells you quite a bit more as you go down to the credit quality level. That's basically what this is saying. You can do this with sort of very, very strong firm level controls, or if you think that that's over controlling in some sense, you can drop some of the controls and you get a bit bigger of a spread. Okay? But again, the basic fact here is we're not only able with our kind of aggregate bond market variable to forecast the overall aggregate uh, investment, we're able to say something about the cross section. So I think that, along with the financing facts, at least gives you a little bit of an in on, uh, on, this, on this credit score. Okay, so that's, that's basically it. Um, that's the basic story. Um, in terms of what does it all mean and why should we care, um, Notice, I, I, I mean, I've, I've left a huge hole here because I'm just talking about the sentiment is kind of like moving around. It's been totally exogenous in the story. You know, why are these expected returns moving around? Of course, the answer for most of it, I don't know. There's starting to be some interesting body of evidence that at least some of this has to do with monetary policy. That might, you know, that doesn't necessarily have a huge R squared, but there's evidence that easier monetary policy seems to be associated with reduced term and credit premium. So maybe that's some of what's going on. If that's the case, and again, this is a big if that I haven't shown it yet, but the thing we're sort of interested in is the following question. Should monetary policy ever take into account these sorts of financial market conditions, even if inflation is nowhere to be seen? Okay. So imagine a world where the Fed's not, not paying attention to inflation. Maybe because it's totally quiet or because whatever, it just doesn't. Okay. Suppose all the Fed cares about is U minus U stall, is keeping unemployment close to target. Okay. But crucially, it cares about it in an intertemporal sense. That is to say, it cares about not only having U close to U star today, but tomorrow and in subsequent years as well. Okay. Now, imagine that you're, you know, imagine that you're at 5% uh, unemployment. Imagine it's today. You're at 5% unemployment, but there's no inflation. 
Is there ever any reason? Suppose the is actually a little too long. Is there ever any reason to raise rates? Okay. Traditional, traditional arguments would find nothing super compelling. Now, suppose I told you, in addition to that, the other fact is credit spreads are exceedingly narrow. Okay. Would that make you a little bit more inclined? I think the answer is at least that this opens the door to that being a thing. In other words, that's a force other, a factor other than just inflation that could weigh in the trade. So now instead of trading off inflation today against you today, you're trading off you today versus you in the future. Now one reason it's nice to nest it this way is that instead of the Fed having a third mandate, you know, inflation, unemployment, and credit market conditions, this stuff should only matter it's a little bit more discipline because this stuff should only matter insofar as you can really establish a link between it and the real economy. So this is a world where, if you believe my evidence, the Fed should pay much less attention to the stock market than potentially you might want to pay to the credit markets. And the final point is the extent to which you weigh this, this quadratic loss function, if you sort of believe it, tells you, suppose I say the unemployment rate is eight. If the unemployment rate is eight and U star is five, that's a very, very big gap. So the marginal value of driving unemployment a little lower today is very high. So even if I tell you there's going to be some bite back effect in the future, it's very likely that the getting things better today thing is going to dominate the potential cost in the future. So even if you believe all of this stuff and you take it way more seriously than you should, probably when the unemployment rate is 8%, even if you're a financial stability maven, you may not be really coming to a different policy. On the other hand, if you star is 4.9 and you're at 5, you know, then you're getting pretty close to the optimum, so the marginal benefit of improving things there may be considerably smaller. And then if there's a meaningful but not huge trade-off in future years, then it may be worth starting to attend to some of these things. Okay, so that's, that's what this stuff would like to ultimately be an input into that kind of policy frame. As I said, it's, it's got quite a ways to go, obviously, before you can take it quantitatively seriously enough to do this, but that's, that's sort of, I think, the, the, the hope for this. Thanks. Well, thanks. 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 thanks.